when I tell people I'm a food reporter, the typical response is lucky you. You get to eat for a living. The job definitely has its perks. Dining out on a regular basis, free food once in a while, and the tough job of eating dessert at every meal. While my career is definitely full of delicious moments, I take my role seriously. But it's been an evolution. Back in the day, I was all about the food trends. Bacon everything. Epic mealtime style dishes. Basically anything that was guaranteed a like or a retweet. But the more time I spent in the industry, the more I felt compelled to learn. Where did my food come from? Who was producing it? What kind of an impact did it have on my health, the planet, and the animals? So I watched food documentaries. I read books and articles. And gradually, the lens through which I saw the food industry began to change. There were certain facts I just couldn't ignore. And there were certain images I just couldn't unsee. So with my new awareness of the inner workings of the food industry, I knew I could no longer continue to report in the same style. I decided to switch my focus away from the trends and more towards those doing positive things with food. Over time, through platforms like Twitter and Instagram, my audience began to grow. People started noticing the content I was creating around food. Restaurant owners told me my Instagram posts were driving traffic to their locations. I noticed the recipes I posted online were being retweeted and shared. The photos I took and the recommendations I made were affecting where and what people ate. All of this reinforced that if I was going to have any sort of influence in the food world, I had to continue to focus on more than just what was popular. There's more to a food reporter's job than simple pleasure seeking. And then I had an epiphany. I am a small fish. Imagine the influence big food media holds. I'm talking about the stars of Food Network, the celebrity chefs, the top food critics and the magazines. Have you ever noticed how greatly they influence us? We recreate the dishes we see on cooking shows. We line up to try the restaurants recommended by top food critics. We salivate over the pictures they post to Instagram. In fact, researchers have found the simplest forms of media, like a magazine food photo, light up the reward centers of our brains and trigger cravings. While I researched for this talk, I found a lot of reading material on the influence of food marketing and food advertising. But the entertainment side of food media? Nothing. What makes this topic even more intriguing is just how big this area of food media has become. Because not long ago, there were just a handful of notable cookbook authors around, like Julia Childs and James Beard. Food media starts to pick up in the 90s. 1990, Martha Stewart Living is born. 1993, TV Food Network launches. 1997, Emeril hits the scene with cooking show Emeril Live. In the early 2000s, Food Network blows up. New programs hit the air, Iron Chef America, Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives, and so many more. A multitude of celebrity chefs and food show hosts are born. The internet is also exploding. Food blogging officially enters the mainstream, giving thousands of foodies a voice and food media a new avenue for sharing. Today, cooking shows are no longer niche educational programs. They're mainstream entertainment. Food media is a multi-billion dollar industry with hundreds of celebrity chefs, thousands of cooking shows, and countless food bloggers sharing daily on social media. Not surprisingly, millennials are the most food-obsessed generation of all time, worshipping celebrity chefs in the same way previous generations worshipped rock stars. So, why do I care if food media has an influence over us? It's because they, the ones we look up to for food-related information, inspiration and guidance have a bias. And this bias is leading us down an unhealthy path. What is this bias? It's a gross imbalance of coverage. It's meat over plants. That's the bias. Now I'm not here to try to convert anyone to vegetarianism today, 
but I am here to raise awareness of a virtually unacknowledged bias, which if shifted, could be a very powerful, positive thing. So before I share the research that has led me to believe our food media is biased, here are the three big reasons why I feel this bias towards meat is so unhealthy. Number one, our planet. The United Nations states that animal agriculture is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation industry combined. One could argue animal agriculture is the leading contributor to global warming. Animal ag also uses up over 50% of our planet's freshwater resources. Now this fact was really put into perspective for me when I learned that one quarter pound hamburger requires over 600 gallons of water to produce. That's equivalent to a four hour shower. Number two, our health. The heavily lobbied meat-loving USDA and Health Canada recommend North Americans eat about three to four ounces of meat or meat alternatives a day. We are currently consuming around nine, despite the fact that countless studies show animal protein contributes to a vast array of diseases like heart disease and diabetes. Just last month, the World Health Organization labeled processed meats a carcinogen and said red meat is probably dangerous too. On the other side of the coin, plants are known to cure. The more plants you eat, the lower the chances of disease forming in the body. Number three, the animals. This year around the world, over 56 billion animals will be killed for food. That's 3,000 animals a second, and I'm not counting the sea creatures. This mass demand for meat has led to factory farming, a fate no species on this planet deserves. And yet, this industrialized system of cages, gestation crates, and electrical prods is where over 96% of the animals raised in North America for food come from. So, it's fair to say animal agriculture is a major contributor to some of our world's most serious problems. Okay, time to share that research that has me convinced our food media has a bias towards meat. I started at the top with Food Network's highest rated show, Chopped. For those of you who don't know, the program is divided into three rounds, appetizer, entree, and dessert. Chefs are provided ingredients and a set amount of time to create their winning dish. For my research, I focused on the entree round, arguably the heart of the show. The entree ingredients featured in the first episode I watched were pate, pork shoulder, mango licorice, and Thousand Island dressing. The second episode centered around beef tongue, the third, a whole chicken thigh. Entree rounds for this season continued in this fashion. Pork, chicken, beef, pork, chicken, beef. I finished the season and realized I hadn't yet seen a single vegetarian entree round. This surprised me, but not being a regular viewer of the show, I figured it was just an unlucky season for vegetables. But I had to find out. So I scanned every single one of CHOP's 299 episodes spanning 25 seasons. Can you guess how many entree rounds did not contain meat? Can you guess? Do you have a number in your head? One. Just one. 298 of CHOP's 299 entree rounds contained meat. Moving along to a top food celebrity who's followed by millions on social networks and beyond. You all know Rachel Ray. This Food Network star has built a food empire worth millions. She's the host of several shows, the author of 21 cookbooks. She's even founded her own magazine. I took a closer look at what she and her team share through their verified Instagram account. After scanning every single one of their posts, I found that excluding desserts and small appetizers, 89% of their content contained meat. In fact, burger posts alone outnumbered the total number of veggie dishes shared in this feed. Now how about the top food magazine in North America? With a circulation of just over three million, Taste of Home is North America's number one cooking magazine, and as they claim, your number one recipe resource for delicious family favorite dishes. So I visited the website and scanned their 600 latest dinner recipes. A little number crunching and counting revealed that 568 of these meal ideas contained meat. That's 95%. 
versus 5%, which were plant-based. Half of these plant-based options were pizza and pasta. This isn't what I would call inspiring. So do you see where I'm going with this? Do you notice the bias? This is the tip of the iceberg. If you take a closer look yourself, you'll notice the same patterns across the board. So if animal agriculture is such a major contributor to some of our world's most serious problems, wouldn't it make sense to curb our coverage of meat, even slightly? I realize these research results paint a bleak and biased picture, but there are individuals within the industry who are committed to using food media in a positive way. Who are they? The Jamie Olivers, who are in the classrooms teaching young kids about the horrors of the fast food industry. The Mark Bittmans and the Michael Pollans, who recognize the importance of plant-based eating and balance their coverage. And the documentarians within food media, who bravely expose the truth so many do not want us to know. The world needs more of this energy. To finish, I have a message for the rock stars of food media. To remain relevant to future generations, you must inspire us with newfound creativity. Instead of another entree round centered around pork, how about a yam or an eggplant or a cauliflower? What about a big juicy veggie burger post on Instagram instead of another beef burger? And those recipe centers, variety is the spice of life. It couldn't hurt to mix it up with a few more veggie forward options. You have a deeper responsibility. Your shows, images, recipes, and articles are shaping what we crave, cook, and eat. And what we eat has enormous consequences on our health, on our planet, and on the animals. And now my message to you. Here's the good news. Despite food media's overwhelming coverage of meat, there are many of us here in this room today who are already focused on making mindful meal decisions. In fact, British Columbia is the most veg-friendly province, with 26% of us focused on reducing our meat intake, and 13% of us identifying as vegetarian. That's 39% of us on the meat reduction bandwagon. But let's not stop here. I believe by being conscious of the food media we consume, this 39% will grow to 49, 59, 69% sooner than we think. I'm inspired by my generation's most celebrated media critic, John Stewart, who shared these words in his farewell show. I say to you tonight, friends, the best defense against BS is vigilance. So if you smell something, say something. I'm saying our vigilance will help raise awareness of the bias in our food media. I'm saying our vigilance will help us champion those within our food media who do balance their coverage. So go ahead and watch an episode of Chopped, but mix in a documentary or a book too. I know that sounds dull, but I promise you will be captivated. Cowspiracy, Earthlings, Project Animal Farm, they will change your life. Need a recipe? Try a plant-based blog. Oh, She Glows, Minimalist Baker, My New Roots, and This Ross and Vegan Life are just some of my favorites. Your dinner guests will swoon. Looking for a celebrity foodie to follow? Check out Laura Miller on Tastemade. She's a plant-loving culinary goddess and completely inspiring. And most importantly, know that these actions will have positive consequences. Believe that you have the power to be a part of this change. And as renowned anthropologist Margaret Mead once said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you very much.